Paul and Silas, and they uh, they are going to a prayer meeting in Philippi. The church, uh, it hasn't been established yet, but there's a church of, of Philippi. They're going there and they're having prayer meetings because they are right now trying to bring together the believers of that of that city. And as they're there, um, um, they're, they are accosted, if, if you will, by a very young lady. And uh, this lady was very much gifted. But as we read about this uh, story, again, normally I would pick and choose certain verses that we can just go ahead and, and just kind of, I would kind of paraphrase certain things, meaning I would break down certain verses. But I want to read this whole story, if you will, this narrative, so that you can understand. Like, I have to assume that many of you don't read, right? I mean, I have to believe that you do read. I want to believe that we all read our Bibles. But let's just say, for instance, as a pastor, I just want to read this in its entirety so that we can all understand what we're, we're, we're doing when we read uh, about uh, old Paul and Silas. Let's go ahead and put that up there on the big screen if you're here. For the first time, you, you can go ahead and follow along. And I'll try to read slow this time. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. I'm going to stop real quick right there. That spirit was Pythonisa. Pythonisa. It's a, in the original language, obviously, it's a serpent. And it was a guardian, a guardian of certain gates in the old, if you will, in the ancient days. And this young female slave she had this evil spirit in her, and the spirit would be no different than your modern-day fortune cookie. <laughs> I know we read, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but horoscopes, right? Yep. So that you'll know how we know that these things have power. How many of you ever opened up a horoscope and you start to read it and you say, Hey, I'm going through that right now, right? Or you go, hey, look what it says. Great prosperity is coming your way. Right? And you say to yourself, hey, what about that money that came my way? Isn't there something that these things that we may take for granted as nothing, no real significant power, they have power. Because they want to hook you and trying to lure you. And this, this young lady, she had that type of power that people would come to her because there was something about her that she gave away truth, or she gave them something that they wanted to hear. Sounds familiar, right? And it says that she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating the customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When they received these orders, they put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. How many of you were in prison? If you've been in prison, would you sing praises to God? And then it says this, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prisoners' do prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourselves, we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, 
Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all of the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for just an incredible time in your presence, Lord. Thank you, for Father, it is in the lyrics, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Father, we believe that name, which is above all names, Lord. It is a name that helps us, enables us, empowers us, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, as I hide behind your precious cross this morning, and we've learned this wonderful lesson and read about this lesson of your servants, Paul and Silas. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will teach us, Lord, that your name is there at our disposal for whatever we need, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Amen. You don't sound convincing to me. A number of points this morning, because we have delivered in his name. The first one is delivered from possession. Amen? Mm -hmm. Delivered from, if I could have put it there, I would have said demonic possession. It says she followed Paul and the rest of the us uh, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. And when we think about that, is there anything wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's truth. That's truth. How would you like it if you're out witnessing to people and somebody came along and you know that they're unbelievers and they go, Brother Justice is there. He's walking around and he's telling you the good news of Jesus Christ and how you can be saved. Brother Justice is there. He's walking around telling you how you can take on good life and abundant life and how you can be saved. After a while, you would think, hey, there's nothing wrong with that in God, right? Everything's good. But Paul is recognizing and because Paul can discern, Paul knew that this girl had this, this spirit within her. Paul knew that this person who had this, this evil spirit within her was only there to just bring whatever you want to call it, hindrance. If you want to call it some form of annoyance. And it's the same way that the adversary or the devil is with us. Paul and Silas were always on their way to a Bible study. They were on their way to a prayer meeting. And it is reminding us as people of God, how many of you, when you're getting ready to go to a quiet place to go and pray, or when you want to turn on your favorite gospel music, or you want to find a place to do your Bible studies, or whatever you are trying to do, it's a discipline of God. And you're trying to do that somehow, some way, there is something to stop you. There is something to bring a hindrance to those disciplines that God is trying to teach you. Amen? And we know the same thing is taking place here. Paul and Silas, they're on their way to a prayer meeting. And here is this girl, she's, she's full of the devil. She's demonic. And she comes in and she's saying a spiritual truth, but she's doing it to mock them. She's mocking the name that is above all names. And it's something that when we think about the things that we believe and we hold so dear, the things of God, and there are things that are in this world that I think that me, we as people of God, we need to grab hold of ourselves. And what are these things? When we hear in the Bible about Rahab, Rahab was what? Prostitute. She was a harlot, a prostitute. Somehow that doesn't seem to bother us. It doesn't. Because we figure she's an adult, she knows, she's, she understands what she's doing, right? We don't make a big deal of that for some reason. We don't. It's, it's almost like we, we kind of say this. Well, she's doing it because she's getting paid for it and she likes what she's doing, but I don't believe any woman grows up as a young child and says, when I grow up, 
I want to be a prostitute. I just want to throw that at you real quick. In the modern day that we live in today, we are awakening every day, and I'm just reminding you of this. There is human trafficking, which is prostitution, but we have learned that term human trafficking because what's come to the forefront is children in human trafficking. Amen? We know this now, and we, the church is awakened by this. We are awakened by this because it sickens us. It sickens us when we find out that young children are used for prostitution. And the church, we need to wake up. Yes. We need to wake up because that could be your own daughter. That could be your own son. That could be your grandson. That could be your granddaughter. Yeah. And we need to wake up and not look at a prostitute that's an adult and say, oh, that happens all the time. Mm. You know, when we think of these certain types of moments that the church, sure, this girl who is a, a fortune teller, she started to begin to bother them because the Bible says each day they arose to go to their prayer meeting, she was there to bring annoyance and to hinder their ability for the spiritual discipline. Every day we wake up, there are various things, ills in a society that we have to contend with. There's poverty everywhere we look. We see people that are homeless everywhere we go. And eventually, we have to say to ourselves, does it ever bother us? There's that big word again. Have we become so desensitized? In other words, are we so insensitive as a people of God that it doesn't bother us anymore? We kind of look at it and accept it for what it is. In fact, we use this phrase that I don't even like to hear. It is what it is. No, we should never use that phrase because as a child of the king, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I, I shared this illustration at the convention. Those of you know of Popeye? <coughs> olive oil? Right? Okay. If you don't know, I know I dated myself. Because they're a cartoon way back in the day. Well, Popeye was a sailor man, and, and he depended on certain <laughs> things called spinach. Right? Those of you that are nodding in affirmative, you just dated yourself, okay? Anyway, so what happened was he had an adversary, and his name was Brutus, and he was a bully. And Brutus would just aggravate him. The Word of God says, annoy him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what annoyed him, but for some reason during the, the cartoon, either was he flirting with olive oil or what have you, but eventually Popeye would just say, I can't stands no more. Remember? <laughs> I can't stands no more. And he would break an old, he would break open a can of spinach and he would chop it down and all of a sudden he would be <laughs> mightier than Mike. He wasn't a superhero. Right? But he was mightier than Mike, right? And he could take on Brutus. And it reminds us about the things that we contend with all the time. You know, as people of God, the Bible tells us about these moments. This woman had to be delivered. She had to be delivered, and she was annoying Paul and Silas every single time they went to the prayer meeting. The same way with the people of God. When is it going to be that moment when you say to yourself, I can't stand no more? And you know what? The, the demons will constantly badger you. They badger us all the single time. And let me, let me bring some understanding for some of you because you're probably saying, well, Pastor Ben, but I'm a child of the king. Yeah, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. A little teaching here. There's possession where this young lady was possessed by these demonics. And there's oppression. So that you'll grab a hold of this when you are, when you are possessed the evil spirit is in you. He dictates your life. He tells you what to do. He tells you how high to jump, you say how high. This is what takes place in society today. Do they, are they around right now? Yes. Today we know that there are people that are, they are possessed by these demonics. It almost sounds like are you telling me that they behave a certain way at certain times? Sure they do. And sometimes it could be people of God. Now I'm not saying they're possessed, 
Because the difference between possession and oppression, being a child of the king, I want you to understand something real quick. The Bible says that the demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us that the demons know that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? The Bible tells us that God, God in his great wisdom, knows and knows who is in. Those people that are in Christ Jesus, we, you need to say this to your neighbor, if you are in Christ Jesus, amen? If you are in Christ Jesus, you cannot be possessed. You, you cannot, cannot be possessed. You cannot be possessed, amen? Amen. amen. You can be oppressed. Yeah. And oppression is a constant. Every time you go, want to go to a Bible study, the demons are telling you, oh, you don't need to go, you're busy. You're going to vacuum the carpet. <laughs> The Raider game is going to come on. You can't do your Bible study. Careful. You can't go to church today. You're going to miss out. Careful. I just, I just lost my feet of <laughs> Oppression is something that we have to deal with all the time as Christians. And it's, it's something that when you think about that, we kind of put it aside, but I'm reminding you because you're a child of the king, mm -hmm. if you're not being oppressed, then I got a question, is Jesus Christ really in you? I mean, think about this. You say, Pastor Ben, what are you saying? If you're not being oppressed, I got a question. Because every time you make a move in Christ Jesus, you should always have that little thought. You know, something's bothering me. Every time you have to make a decision in your life, every time you have to go to prayer, every time you have to go to church, every spiritual thing, if you want to praise God and you've you're having this thought of maybe you shouldn't be praising God, right? Look what happened. God allowed, think about this. The devil will tell you, why are you praising God? He allowed Florida to take place. Mm. You understand that? You know what makes me laugh? I'm not a celebrity type of guy where, you know, how these celebrities, they like to kind of open their mouths and you got to wonder, are they having one of those moments? Well, there's a celebrity who will be nameless who kind of accused the president of having such power that the hurricane is destroying all of Florida because of him. And it makes you laugh. It makes you laugh. Are you kidding me that the president of the United States has that much authority that he could take a hurricane and force it to go to a state? Are you kidding me? It just shows us that those of us that are followers of celebrities, don't listen to everything you hear, please. Because you know, it tells us these people have no clue. They have no clue. You're talking about demon possession. I mean, when they don't know, when they may just open their mouths and they're not really thinking about what they're saying, it makes you wonder about what's really... Oh, let me leave that alone. Okay? Let me take on some verses here. It says this, so everybody knows a Christian cannot be possessed, amen? Okay, this is where I got all those, Mark chapter 3, verses 22 and 27. It says this, but the teachers of the re religious law who were arrived from Jerusalem said, he's ta they're talking about Jesus, he's possessed because he's, he's doing things uh, with people that are demon possessed. He's possessed by Satan. The prince of demons, that's where he gets his power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with the illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. So he illustrates this once again. He says, who is, who is powerful enough to enter a house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone who is even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house, amen? And then it says this, and this is the verse that you should memorize. And you hear me quote this all the time. It's in John, 1 John 4, 4. And this is the King James Version. Ye, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. If you're taking those, you need to write this one on your heart. Because every time you deal with issues, circumstances, trials, where the devil begins to start teaching you things and, and you begin to wonder, should I be listening to this voice that is starting to just pester me? 
Say this to the devil. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he, Jesus Christ, that is in me than he that is in the world. In other words, devil, get thee behind me. Amen? You have that authority, amen, in Christ Jesus. You have that authority because you are a child of the king. Amen? Again, people that are not believers in Jesus Christ, they're going to be... They're just going to be badgered for the rest of their lives until they say, Jesus, come into my life. Amen? There's another story I want to uh, share with you how we know that demons literally don't know and they go by um, who they know is in you. Amen? There's this, it's found in Acts chapter 19, and I just kind of want to pound this in us as people of God. It's in Acts chapter 19, and it's called the Seven Sons of Sceva. Turn your neighbor and say Sceva. Sceva. And it's a story about some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, and they tried this, and they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over these demon-possessed people. Remember, if you're an unbeliever, you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, and let's say I'm a non-believer, and I'm, I'm, I like what's going on because I see... Sister Renee and Brother Kevin, and we're, we're, I see these people, and they're evoking the name because they know the authority of God, and God knows them, amen? And I see it, and I go, wow, that's kind of cool, right? These guys, they know what they're doing, and so I go around doing it, and I begin to do it, and the demons know that I don't know God, and this is what's, what's going on here, and they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They say, I command you to come out. It says this, these were the seven sons of Sceva. And of course, one of us was a Jewish chief priest. So one day, they went and they saw this evil spirit. And the evil spirit, they saw this evil spirit in this person. And this evil spirit answered him and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. And I know Paul. I know all about Paul. Yeah. But who are you? The demons know what authority lives in you. Yeah. Oh, come on, church, right? Yeah. The demons know that you have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in you. Yes. For greater is He. Amen? Amen? And this is something that we as a people of God, we need to relish this. We need to uplift the name of Jesus because when we walk around, this is the no, this is how we know. When we walk around, there's a certain representation in us that the demons say, you know what? That's that's occupied. He's that person's occupied. Yeah. I have no power over them. Amen. And when we walk around, this is the thing. We have the power that when we can discern when people are behaving poorly. That you have the power to pray yeah. to tell that spirit to get out. Amen? Yes. I don't know if you feel that way. When you come into a certain home, you can sense. Yeah. You can sense when certain things are right in a person's home. Pray with God's authority. I'm not saying that you're going to walk in your friend's house. Is that everybody here walks in? And I can just envision some of you going to your friend's house and you go, Pastor Sam said, do this. <laughs> when you go in their friend's house and it's a football game, right? When you go in their friend's house and you look around and you go, in the name of Jesus, right? You can discern. You can discern. And you can just pray this under your breath. Because I'm here to tell you, because you are a child of the king, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You represent the king of kings, amen? And because of the authority that is given to all of us, amen, God said these things would follow us wherever we go, amen. The demons know who you are. And how would you, it's a wonderful thing. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, and Antonio I know, and Paul I know, and Rusty I know. Yeah. This is the demons. They know who you are. Yes. And they tremble at the name that is behind your name. Amen? Amen. 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 I tell you, delivered from possession, and we have that authority when we pray. In fact, I think my wife shared this story with me, and this is not an indictment on 
people that believe in another denomination, but there was a person who was a believer of another teaching, and they don't believe in these these things that we believe in when it comes to the, the supernatural, if you will. They were Baptists. So if you're watching on, t uh, on the internet, that's who they were. They were a Baptist preacher, and they had these uh, evil spirits that were going on in somebody's life, and they they felt they, they should go and pray for them. So they invited a Pentecostal preacher to go with them. Amen. That made me feel so good. That made me feel so good. Because it reminds us that we know. We know. We have the authority. Amen? We have the authority. Now it's not again. It is not in the name of Ben. And we have to acknowledge that. We know the authority that cast out spirits. Amen? Where a Pentecostal preacher needs to be invited to pray for somebody, the, the, my wife told me it took a number of hours, but they tarried. And to God be all the glory. Amen? That's what it took. They weren't there to just give grace and just pray over a person. They prayed and they tarried until something happened happen. Amen. Amen. Just push. Amen. Push. I'll move on to my next point. So we go um, from delivered from possession to delivered <clears throat> by praise. Turn your neighbor and say, I love the praise. I love, I love the, the praise. praise. Amen. But will you praise if you are incarcerated? Mm -hmm. Will you praise when you're going through a difficult time in your life? Yes. If when you, you something I, I want to throw out there when I think about delivered by praise, it says that Paul and Silas were in prison. And it wasn't just prison, it was in the inner prison. There were there were so do you understand in the ancient days there were people that were prisoners, and then there were people that were in the inner prison. They had to make sure that these two, Paul and Silas, weren't going to escape. And the Bible tells us that they were shackled and their feet, they were placed in, that, that's got to be very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. in stocks. Yeah. So how, how are you, you're going to sit like this the whole time? And I'm thinking about this, while they were there in this very uncomfortable position, they're saying, to God be the glory. I mean, can you envision that? And everybody's probably looking at him and saying, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. Do you see what's, what's happening to you? And they're still praising God. Amen. And the people of God need to remind ourselves when we talk about being delivered by praise, we forget this all the time. We, you hear this. We should be praising God in the good, time, praising God in the good times and in the bad times. The bad times. The bad times include even when it's personal. When it seems like God is so far removed from your life. When it seems like God, when a bad thing has happened to you, you're saying, God, where are you? Because God hasn't moved, you moved. Amen? When things are so horrific in your life, can you still praise God, church? Can you still lift up the name of Jesus? Can you sing praises to his name? When your loved one's on a deathbed, can you still say, God, I trust you. I believe in you. I know that you're going to deliver my loved one. And even, and even if you call my loved one home, I will still praise your name. If you're about to lose your job, if you're about to lose your job and they're hanging out pin slips, can you still lift up the name of Jesus knowing that your God is Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides? Can you still lift up the name of Jesus? If you were about to go to a doctor and you go to the doctor and the doctor, they've had a biopsy done on you. You don't know what it is, but everybody knows when they say we have to do a biopsy on this, you're already apprehensive. You're a little afraid and you're wondering, can it be cancer? Can you still go into the doctor's office and still sing and praise God and say, God, whatever happens, God, I still trust you. I still believe you. I extol you. I magnify your name. I still praise you, God. I give you praise ahead of time, even when I don't know what the outcome is. Delivered by praise. 
The Bible says that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Amen. What a wonderful sight. They're lifting up the name of Jesus. And you know what? I'm thinking about Paul and Silas. Nothing says that they had the ability to sing. You know what I'm talking about? I know that Paul is well schooled. It doesn't say anything about his ability to sing. I know King David could probably sing. Right? King David probably is, is uh, 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 Marvin Sapp. He could probably sing. I mean, but there are certain people in the kingdom of God that should be left preaching. Amen? <laughs> Not to say that they can't sing, but there are certain people, I mean, I'll be honest with Pastor Francis, I mean, if you want to be on the worship team, you have to audition. Right? And I'm not saying that she won't select you, but if you're tone deaf, it's kind of hard, right? I used to sing in a mass choir in another place where I used to practice, and Flo Quillatang, she would make us all audition if you wanted to sing. She would find out, okay, what are you? Are you a bass? You know, and, and she'd say, okay, I want you to follow along with me and sing this song with me. You know, if you were tone deaf, if you couldn't capture the note that she sang when she played it on the piano, she goes, well, thank you for having your desire to want to sing. I mean, you, it, it, I watched it. I would see people that wanted, we had a 200-piece choir. Everybody wanted to be part of the choir. You know, everybody, and they had auditions, and we would sit back there, and when we watched people that couldn't hit the note, you would go, oh, they can't sing. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Sister Iris, to God be all the glory. Amen. It says that at midnight, Paul and Silas and all the prisoners were listening, and then verse 26. You know, I love that word in the gospel of Jesus Christ, because God works in the suddenly, amen? That's a wonderful thing about God, and I love the word because it always says suddenly. <clears throat> when you're praising God, God brings out the suddenly. Amen? And this is something that we need to remind ourselves. When we're praising God, God works in the suddenly. When you're praising God, suddenly somebody is healed. When you're praising God, suddenly somebody is released to freedom. Amen? When you're, when you're praising God, suddenly somebody's chains, their shackles are removed. Amen? When you're praising God, amen? Your problems suddenly disappear, amen? amen? When you're praising God, right, whatever issues, whatever trials you're going through, suddenly God takes charge, amen? amen. God delivers in praise, by praise, amen? That's how God operates. God says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake. And you're probably saying, did God have to use an earthquake? Yes, he did. God chooses whatever things he needs to do to release the captives. Amen? Amen? And if it takes a massive earthquake to shake things up, some of you need to get so shook up because some of us in the household of faith are so, we are so locked up. We are so caged up that God needs an earthquake to shake you up. Amen? Turn your name Are you shook up? Are you shook up? Because let me tell you, church, some of us are so held in bondage by the isms of religion. Some of us are held in bondage by the way we worship. Some of us are so held tight that for some other reason, God needs to shake the foundation of wherever you came from. This is who God is and this is how God operates, amen? Sometimes when we think about earthquakes, we think of the devastation that could take place. I'm talking about <coughs> spiritual earthquakes. Yeah. We, as a people of God, need to, need to let God be God. Amen. And God needs to shake some of us up so that we, the shackles, the shackles that so hold us down. You know, I am saddened that we, as a people, we've come through what I call a revival. And we cannot allow ourselves to get sucked back into the way we were. And I'm speaking to the men of this church. I'm speaking to the men of this church because some of the women right now, 
They're in, in Jerusalem right now. Yes. And they're yes. dancing like fools to the same a road that maybe David took while he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant. Amen? And people were probably wondering, and I'm thinking about my sisters right now. They know that this same Ark came from Obed-Edom. And they knew that this Ark was coming to David's house. And David danced around this Ark like a fool. Yeah. Some of us need to dance before the presence of God. Amen? We can't get shackled, church. We need to allow ourselves to be free in the presence of God. And men of God, those of you, we said stand up. Amen? You need to stand up. Don't let a weekend allow to go by. And we say, oh, that was just an experience for that one weekend? No. It's a lifetime experience, amen? It should have changed the way you were. This altar is an altar of praise, amen? And when we come up here during the time of worship, don't get sucked into thinking, you know what, that was then, this is now. This is every time we're here, amen? Worship is, a, is, worship is not a time on Sundays only. It's a lifestyle, amen? It's who we are, because God created us to worship. Amen. Delivered by praise. Amen. God even uses earthquakes to, to effect change in people's lives. And it reminds me of when we praise. You know, there are some stories, and we think about, that's why I say David. When David, if you know the story of David, King David, David was drove away by this man called Abimelech. And Abimelech kicked him out, got rid of David. And David penned this psalm in Psalm 34. He said when he was going through a difficult trial, he penned this psalm in 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually on my mouth. Amen. So it's a reminder to us that even King David, when going through a, a difficult time in his life, he goes, I will bless the Lord. His praise will be continually on my mouth. Amen. James tells us the same thing in James chapter 5 verse 16. He says that when you go through a difficult time, he says, pray. Pray, church. That's why as a pastor, there's a difficult time going on in our nation. I just can't come up here and just proclaim God's word and just give you something that you may need for the week. God is prompting me. You can't just do that. We need to pray as a people. Because there are other people that are in need of prayer. And James tells us when you go through a difficult time in your life, pray. Pray, church. I'm reminding you of this because every first Wednesday of the month, every first Wednesday of the month, I don't know what you're doing. Maybe if you have to work, I get it. But if you're at home watching TV, doing dishes, vacuuming the floor, doing your honeydews, be here. Be here. Mm -hmm. If for some reason you can break away, just give God one hour of the entire month. Come here and watch God move. Amen? Here, th th we're talking these wonderful testimonies of how God delivers people. Some of you have prayers that have been asked. We used to have that prayer wall that was up there. Some of you have asked the church, can you pray for me for this? Can you pray for me for that? You don't even know by the prayers of the saints on the first Wednesday of every month and every Thursday of every week. You ask, but you don't know if these prayers are being answered. Mm -hmm. And you need to be sustained in your prayer. Sustained meaning as you're continually asking God. God, you're knocking on, God, on heaven's door. God. Can you do this? God, can you save my loved one? God, I, I need a job. God, can you provide this for me? I mean, continual, just coming before God, God's throne, because God tells us, come boldly before his throne, amen? But we, when it's a personal need, God invites you to come boldly to his throne. You know, I'm not saying that prayer is diminished. When you ask people to pray for you, it could be like if I go to Pastor Renee and say, hey, Pastor Renee, can you pray this for me when you go on Wednesday? 
I'm not saying that there's less power in that and less effectiveness, no. I'm saying it's different when you go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You have an opportunity to come boldly to the throne of grace. Because I'm going to put it this way. She doesn't know my heart like I know my heart. She doesn't know my needs like I know my needs. The angst of prayer, the hurt of prayer. In other words, when you really need something, you think about this church, I've, I've, I've taught this. When you really want something from your earthly parents, would you tell your brother and ask for me to? Think about this, this is my illustration. Let's say sister was my, Marley was my sister. Let's say she was my sister. She's my sister in the Lord, but let's say she was my biological sister. If I ask her, hey, I know you're going out tonight, but ask dad and mom for me too, right? <laughs> it's not the same thing. Because you know what? Because if she were to say, uh, mom, dad, I'm going to go out and bed too, right? It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Because maybe mom and dad know something about them that she doesn't know. And it's the same way God is with us. God expects us to go before his throne of grace. He doesn't want a second-hand petition. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to teach you. If you have a certain need before God, don't ask me to pray for you, and especially if it's something you really, 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 really need. Mm -hmm. The kind of need where you want to fall before his feet and cry and tell God, I really need this. I really need this, God. I need you to come through for me on this. I'm not going to go to somebody and say, hey, do you think you can grieve that same passion that I'm going to give God? No. They won't know the need that you know. Go before God because this is how God teaches. And James tells us the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's great power in prayer. And when you have that same passion before the King of Kings, God opens a window. Amen? Amen. So we go from uh, delivered, um, from possession to delivered by praise to lastly, delivered in believing. Amen? I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at the time. But we're not program oriented. <laughs> delivered in believing. It says, and this is the, the best part of the story, because Paul and Silas are in prison. The jailer woke up. There's a massive earthquake. And the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. In the ancient days, if you're a, a prison guard, and if the doors and everything swung open, and if you lost one prisoner, you were going to be executed. So the jailer saw this, he knew there was an earthquake, the doors are wide open, all doors are wide open. I'm thinking that back in the ancient days when they were shackled, if people were running out, think about it, they're going to be shackles everywhere, right? And the jailer comes out and he looks, there's no shackles everywhere. And he's about to take his sword, I'm trying to envision this, does he take his sword it's not one of those big monster swords like this, right? It's probably one of these little small ones, and he's going to take it, and he's going to go. Right? Everybody's cringing. <laughs> but that's what happened. He was about to kill himself, the Bible tells us. But Paul and Silas, they scream out, Don't do it. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. Because they knew. Think about this. Paul knew God used the earthquake to free them. And they didn't run. But Paul also knew that he was a Roman citizen too. And being a Roman citizen, there was certain inalienable rights as a Roman citizen. There were certain privileges, if you will. And for them to have to endure getting flogged, the Bible says they got hit with rods. You guys remember um, the movie uh, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? No? Yeah. 
Remember when he was lying on the floor? Remember he's now released and he was lying on the floor and then his, his uh, protector, what's his name, uh, comes in and he's looking for his master and he looks and he sees his back, yeah. right? And he goes, oh, Maria, he sees he goes, does that hurt? You remember? Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He has this, these, these big old welts on his back and I'm thinking, Paul and Silas, being Roman citizens, they weren't entitled to that. But the Bible tells us that they stopped the jailer from, from killing himself and the jailer knowing all that took place, he, he comes and the Bible tells us because of the grace that was extended the jailer through the worship and praise. And I believe this, that Paul and Silas were already witnessing to all those that were in prison. And the jailer, after the, this, this powerful earthquake, earthquake that took place, Knowing what has happened and the grace that was extended to him already, the Bible tells us that the jailer fell at the feet of Paul. He fell at his feet and said, what must I do to be saved? Amen? And that is a powerful theological question, if you will, to all of humanity. What does that mean? It means that there are people where things have happened in their lives, and they're wondering, these horrific things, these trials, these circumstances that have happened in their life and by God's grace God protected them and I don't know what it may be it may have been a car accident it may have been a sickness it could have been something where somehow some way God's grace was given to them and that question always comes up when they say how did I how, did, how was I protected from that and the question would come how must I or what must I do to be saved amen and that's, that, that question is ever before everybody that we come in contact with. We have to pray that one day that same question will be asked from all of us. When people come to us and they see your life, they say to you, why are you the way you are? How can I experience what you experience? How can I be like you are when you go face tragedy? It's the same question. How can I be saved? How can I be the person that you are? How can I be saved? It's the same way if you're brand new here to our church and you're saying, how do you guys give glory to God for even a tragedy that has taken place in Florida? Because we believe God is in control. In spite of even some hardships, in spite of maybe even loss of life, we still believe that God is in control. And as ugly as it may seem, whether it be an earthquake that Paul and Silas experienced or a flood that took place in Texas or, or a hurricane that takes place in Florida, God is sovereign and God is in control. And no, God does not allow these things to take place. God didn't say, I'm going to put a hurricane there and a flood there and an earthquake there. God knows that we live in a world that has fallen. But God makes even the bad things turn out for good. Amen? Amen? God tells us this and he reminds us that even when you endured a very difficult time in your life, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his rich purpose. Amen? Amen. We as people got embraced that truth. Not everything in this world is good. But we know that all things work together for good. Amen? Amen. Because this, this same jailer, he was delivered because he believed. Amen? Romans 14, 11, It says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? And now when you read that passage right there, that does not mean that when people eventually... Wow, this is a prophetic verse. It means that one day, even non-believers, even non-believers, people that don't believe in Jesus Christ, that have denied Jesus Christ, this verse, being prophetic as it is, is telling us there will be a day that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when that, that verse comes to fruition, that will be the day when those people that deny Jesus Christ will have to bow a knee. 
and they will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does that mean they're forever and in eternity? No. It means they had no choice. They had no choice. And God will remind them that you had every opportunity to believe in me, just like this jailer. The jailer said, how? Can, how can I be saved? Amen? And you know, when I think about the love of God and His grace and everything that He's done for us, and I, and I recognize that there is great truth because it's in the name of Jesus, church. It is in the name of Jesus, as a song we sang this morning, His name, that we know we can ask anything. Amen? We can ask anything in His name. We can gather in His name. Amen? We are healed in His name. Amen? We are delivered in His name. It's things that we can remember as people of God, the spiritual truths. It is in the name of Jesus that we have breath. Amen? It's who we are in Christ Jesus. Let me, let me summarize this. We are delivered by, by possession because of the authority that we have. Now, I, I, as I alluded to, if you were a child of the King and you asked Jesus Christ into your life, you cannot be possessed, but you do have the authority to tell that spirit to come out of people. Amen? And we are delivered by praise. It is in the praise, because by praising God, all things are released. Amen? And lastly, we are delivered in believing. Just like the jailer, it took a massive earthquake to shake things up, but sometimes God uses even something as horrific as an earthquake to shake people up so that they will one day bow their knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Father, I